Yesterday we celebrated the life and the love and the vision of our friend and founding pastor, Reverend Bill Smith. We ran a video of his last sermon when he retired. His remarks were relevant then and they are relevant now. We celebrate his life, acknowledge the end of an era, and we mark the beginning of a new chapter in the life of Shadow Rock. I do not know if Bill knew his sermon 25 years ago would be re-preached at his funeral. Since I wrote this, I found out he did not plan that. However, it could not have been planned better. Bill's sermon showed us that who we are and what we stand for as a congregation has been consistent. He stated that Shadow Rock is to be a different kind of church so as to raise up a different kind of people, so as to build a better world. Our brand is consistent. Our infrastructure is to be examined. So we have been going through a sermon series about community being who we keep within sight and sound that has infrastructure implications. Church is not where we go. Church is what we create when we are together. We can be a bad church or we can be a good church. A good church or a good fellowship is a community of people who are committed to keeping each other, their true selves, and their neighbors within sight and sound. People who are in a good community of faith and conscience experience being really seen and really heard. To be invisible, to be ignored is to not be valued as a human being. It is to be dismissed. And to be dismissed is to have one's dignity waved off and tossed away. Well, there is another dimension to being an effective community of faith and care. In addition to keeping each other, our true selves, and our neighbors within sight and sound, we benefit from keeping God within sight and sound. This is the trickiest task of all. How do we keep in sight who cannot be seen? How do we hear the one who is best heard in the long and deep silences of life? Most people see us and know us as the church of inclusion and justice. It is true that these are two of our core values, but our openness to all people, our yearning work for justice, is grounded in a burning heart of spiritual connection. To know God and be known by God. Inclusion and justice falls way short if it is not grounded in spirituality. Allow me to offer some practical advice for keeping God within sight and sound. One, challenge and adjust your current thinking about God. We are finite beings, and whenever we attempt to think of the infinite, we will fall short, and therefore we should always, always be prepared to undo our current illusion in order to grow into a deeper truth. We are products of our culture, and our culture is shaped by a Western Christianity that has done more harm than good. Western Christianity has proposed that we are separated from God and because of the human theological construct of original sin and the act of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was the bridge that overcomes the separation, we have within us a deep-seated conviction that we are too dirty 
are too ugly, are too stupid, are too bad, that the image of God cannot be in us. And when we do that, then we miss the part of God that is right in front of our eyes when we look in the mirror. Remember Jahari's window from a couple of weeks ago? One of the reasons we cannot find God is because we are looking in the wrong places, mostly outside our hidden, blind, and unknown selves. And that is where God dwells, in the secret places. The more we reveal in the blind, hidden, and unknown parts of ourself, the more expansive our true and known self becomes. And the more God can be seen and heard, not only in us, but through us. We will not find God in a book. We will not find God in a church or synagogue or a mosque or any other designated holy geography. The holy is everywhere and everywhere we are. Two, there may be no difference between your thought of God and desire for God and God's self. Our thinking may be going against what we suspect is true, but afraid to admit. We keep looking outside ourselves for God. We keep thinking that we are on the outside like the unwise virgins of the parable, wanting into the wedding party of life, on the outside, knocking on the door, begging to come in. Rumi, the Sufi poet, said it a different way. I have lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking on doors. The door opens. And then I discover I've been knocking from the inside all the time. You will decide how to regard any of this. That is up to you. But please know that how you decide, whether or not you are on the outside trying to get in, or already on the inside, and God is tapping you on the shoulder, makes all the difference in the world. I would suggest, however, remain open to the possibility that your every thought of God and what follows might just be God awakening in you. Ralph Emerson said, Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, know that we carry it within us, or we find it not. Three, practice trusting that God is not separate from you, but already dwells in you. We live a lot of our life acting how we feel and therefore give a lot of power away. We see and hear this in our children, why didn't you do your homework? I didn't feel like it. Why didn't you clean your room? I didn't feel like it. Over time, we learn to push ourselves and do the things we have to do even when we don't feel like it. This is part of maturing, taking responsibility, being an adult. I hate that. As adults, we may let ourselves slide from time to time to give in to our feelings and slough off our responsibilities. Reminds me of the man who stayed in bed and his wife kept saying, you got to get up. You got to go to church. I don't want to go to church. You got to get up. You got to go to church. I'm not going to church. I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like going to church. You got to go to church. You're the minister. But even when we bite the bullet and make ourselves act like adults, we are still operating under the principle that we act how we feel. 
The opposite psychological principle is also true. But we don't keep it in mind or let it guide us to the same extent. And that principle is that we feel how we act. I've always found it interesting that when Paul wrote to the community of faith and conscience in Colossae, he used a clothing metaphor, the term put on, as we sang just a few minutes ago. He says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You see, how you dress... This is what it means to put on. Put on the right garment. Put on the right clothes. How you dress to the party of life makes a difference. It is important to dress appropriately. As human beings trying to keep God within sight and sound, we may not feel like being kind. We may not feel like being humble or gentle, patient or loving. But nevertheless, put on compassion. Put on kindness and humility, gentleness, patience, and above all else, put on love. We act as if, and the reality will come. This is not wishful thinking. It is not being false. This is not believing against reality. This is trusting in the deeper reality that God is love. And when we act accordingly, that reality shows itself through us. Then, then we are keeping God within sight and sound. Number four, remember, God is in every human being. There's a great deal of arrogance in thinking that no one else is seeking God. There's a great deal of self-centeredness in thinking that no other human heart desires to see, hear, or be touched by God as much as I. When I remind myself that the image of God in all other human beings is doing the best they can every day, just like me, then I see them as my sister. I see them as my brother. When I see another human being as part of the same human family that I am a part of, then I began to see and hear the God that is parent of all of us. Number five. Be still and know I am God. These words are from Psalm 46. They make me think first of a lack of noise pollution that contributes to soul clutter. Quiet is good. It is one of the reasons I like getting up in the morning before everyone else and drinking coffee. I'm better able to be still in the stillness. However, there is more going on here for the writer of praise and prayer songs, the psalmist. The Hebrew is one word, meaning that which takes us two words to convey. It is an orientation of spirit to life. For the psalm writer, it is a state of being for the true self and a state of relationship with reality. The layers of meaning include be still, relax, let go, release control. As we prepared for Reverend Bill Smith's celebration of life, there were many strong personalities. Can you believe it? <laughs> many strong personalities wanting to make sure it happened just right. Another way to say it, we had a lot of control freaks trying to run the show. <laughs> what some people didn't know, what they couldn't see, what they couldn't hear, 
is that we know how to do things here. It was not until they could be still, relax, let go, release control, could they see and hear the gifts that we have to offer. This is true as we try to keep God within sight and sound. We cannot see or hear God until we are still, relaxed, and releasing control. Only when we let go and let God will we open ourselves to the possibility of seeing and hearing God working in our lives and in our world. There's a lot here. Challenge, adjust your current thinking about God. There may be no difference between your thought of God and desire for God and God's self. Practice trusting that God is not separate from you but already dwells in you. Remember, God is in every human being. Be still and know that I am God. These past few weeks, I have encouraged us to work and strive to keep each other, our true selves, and our neighbors within sight and sound. This is what it means to create and sustain our community. However, in a way, I'm asking you to stop trying to find God. I know this seems strange that a minister of the good news would ask you to stop trying to find God. But there it is. Why? Because it isn't necessary. Besides, you cannot find what is not lost. In the end, my friend, the question How do I find God is the wrong question and actually born of an inadequate theology. God is in you already. If Jesus' life and death and teachings make anything clear, it is this. The veil is torn. The wall of separation was all an illusion. God is with you. God is in you. And when you stop striving, God reveals God's self to you. I want to share just a little poem I've carried with me for decades now. It's called, Where God Ain't. Sorry, English teachers. He was just a little boy on a week's first day. He was wandering home from Sunday school and dawdling on the way. He scuffed his shoes into the grass. He found a caterpillar. He found a fluffy milkweed pod and blew out all the filler. A bird's nest in a tree overhead so wisely placed on high was just another wonder that caught his eager eye. A neighbor watched his zigzag course and hailed him from the lawn asked him where he'd been that day and what was going on. I've been to Sunday school, he said, and turned a piece of sod. He picked up a wiggly worm, replying, I learned a lot of God. Very fine, a very fine way, the neighbor said, for a boy to spend his time. If you tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, the answer came, nor were his accents faint. I'll give you a dollar, mister, if you can tell me where God ain't. (laughs) Keep each other, your true self, your neighbor, and God within sight and sound. Amen.